can start, I believe. So thanks for the seminar, Chris. Uh, I will just give a brief introduction and uh, your biography for people who are interested. So uh, Dr. Christopher Zuling uh, is uh, a PhD, has a PhD in quantitative psychology from the University of Illinois. Uh, he's uh, currently a postdoctoral flow at the Beckman Institute at the University of Illinois. His uh, research focuses on human performance optimization and he collaborated in projects supported by uh, YARPA and uh, about nutrition, DARPA and the Air for Research Laboratory. Uh, thanks, Chris, for uh, joining the SDSA research seminars, and we are glad for having your presentation and the research areas that you are interested. Yeah, thank you very much for the nice introduction, and I'm happy and excited to chat with you a little bit about our research. Um, and I'm going to share my screen here, short up, but I got a short presentation. Um, so, yeah, one of, one of the main goals is to uh, just provide some background information and um, understanding of the project we're doing. Um, that's the first thing. But the second thing is, and uh, we're, we're interested in identifying collaborators who might want to be uh, work with us on this project going forward. And so at the end of this presentation, I'll provide you know my contact information if, if this project sounds of interest to you uh, to see if you would be uh, interested in joining us as we do this uh, work in the future. Make this full screen. Okay. Okay, so the program that we're currently in is something called Measuring Biological Aptitude. Uh, this is sponsored by DARPA. And the overall objective of this program is to use cognitive, behavioral, um, sensor data, molecular data, genetic data, a broad swath of data which can be collected from individuals and use, identify a subset of those variables, many, you know, thousands or hundreds of thousands of variables in total, identify the subset of variables that seem to be most predictive of an outcome measure that is um, of interest to, in this case, the military. And so it's a it's an optimization problem in some sense of the word, but we're optimizing features of individuals is what we're trying to figure out. Like, is there something we can identify or collect from an individual um, at one point in time that we use to indicate performance at a later point in time? So that's kind of the overarching goal. And I've been working on this project for a couple of years now, and it's it's been very interesting and very enlightening. And uh, um, but like I said, we we I'll share some de little more details of how we're kind of doing this process so far. Um, and hopefully, I give you more information about what the project's like. Before getting to the specifics, though, I just want to um, take a moment to introduce our team. We have several individuals who have um, different backgrounds in terms of interests and expertise. And so we're led by Aaron Barbet. He's a professor of psychology. Um, also, he's in uh, bioengineering and neuroscience. And he is also works closely with Steve Culpepper, as most of you probably know from statistics department. So Steve is our uh, statistics guru on this project. He's the expert in that area. Um, there's myself, as uh, Mayor Dead already introduced me. Um, I have expertise in statistics and psychology and neuroscience as well. Um, and I, I play a leading role in this project to kind of coordinate uh, analyses and organize um, you know, results and present the, and help present those during the PI meetings. And then we have several um, graduate students working with us. There's Ramsey Wilcox. He's a psychology graduate student, and he has a strong uh, background in, in data analysis and psychology and neuroscience. And Evan Anderson is an advanced graduate student. He's nearly completing his time um, with us as a graduate student, and he has has very good computational neuroscience skills, very good um, programming skills, and very good data analytics skills. And he's been very instrumental in helping us develop this, um, the backbone of the software that we're that I'll share more about here in a minute. And then Kyle Bakey, he's been a recent addition to our team, but he's been working with us. He has a little bit of knowledge of molecular and genetic data, and he's been uh, working with us on that um, over the last few months. And so we have a couple other individuals who play more uh, peripheral, but um, like I said, we're, we're looking to um, identify additional collaborators who would be willing to join and complement um, our research interest here. So the framework, the, um, what do you call it? The um, analytical framework, there we go, that we use in this um, program is something called inference. And that stands for intelligent forecasting through explanatory reasoning and contextual learning. We actually developed this framework in a separate DARPA program, DARPA Taylor, 
And we developed that in consultation with our colleagues at Georgia Tech. Uh, most of the people from Beckman were the same individuals, but uh, we had some additional collaborators. And this was a, a, a prior, prior developed software framework, analytical framework that we developed. And we've adapted in different ways to this measure, measuring biological aptitude uh, program um, that we're talking about now. And so just briefly take a moment or two to describe what inference does and how it works at a high level. Um, so it's a novel artificial intelligence framework for the design of personalized training, readiness, and recovery programs that are tailored to an individual's cognitive biological phenotype. And so this gets us the idea that, you know, we're looking at features across individuals like, you know, like cognitive and behavioral and molecular features, but at the same time, we're trying to identify like within individuals, which of those features really matter. So it's both like individual variables, individual features, but also um, for a particular candidate, particular individual, what matters. And that's, we're talking about personalized elements. Um, uh, and then that, and the phenotype is those different features that we refer to. So the inference framework consists of uh, a couple parts. So at the highest level, we um, are working with trying to identify and characterize residuals um, at multiple levels of resolution. And so we do that with what we call um, two, these reasoners, these reasoning systems. And so right as of right now, we have two separate reasoners. Um, one is called case-based reasoning. Um, and I'll explain more about that particular reasoner in a moment. But the basic idea is that it builds a phenotypic library from previous cases that seen before and uses those to make predictions of individual outcomes at the level of the subject. And then the second reasoner we have currently is called Bayesian belief networks. Um, and these enable causal modeling, at least the potential for causal modeling of these phenotypes um, and outcome predictions that take a phenotypic causal model into account. So here we're trying to maybe more understand the structure of the um, variables and how they relate to one another and to get at individual um, predictions from those models. And then what we do with those two reasoners is put those outputs, those predictions from each of those reasoners into a so-called meta-learning system, which combines these predictions to generate robust inferences and account for individual differences across multiple data sets, phenotypes, and operational contexts. And so it's one of the things about this inference framework that we um, uh, like to emphasize is, is the robustness. We I developed it on one um, program and we're applying it to the different program. And you'll see here in a moment how we applied it to this previous program, but um, it has this flexibility because you know it doesn't, it's not required to operate for specific, um, only specific instances or context or data sets. It's very, it's very general. So that's a strength of the system. And the other thing I'll say is, you know, as of right now, we have these two reasoners, but one thing we are currently working on the program is to try to roll in or build additional reasoners to complement this. Um, and I'll, so that's something that we're also interested in doing in terms of enhancing the, the robustness of this system. And so yeah, overall, um, this is how this system works. So, so just to give a sense for how this um, inference protocol worked or performed in a previous program, this is the DARPA-Taylor program, um, we had five competing, com competitive teams, former teams, we call them, and we were tasked to do is uh, make these counterfactual predictions. So a counterfactual prediction is something where um, you're asked to predict what would happen if circumstances had been different. So like if um, you're asked to predict how well a person would do, um, say if they were on a team with uh, people who are taller versus people who are shorter, like you can actually maybe run that experiment, but you can use data and information from um, other contexts in the experiment to maybe assess how a person might perform if they've been different contexts. So you're not actually running the experiment, you're just kind of actually thinking about that experiment. And so we made these predictions across different domains of physical fitness, endurance, cognition, the molecular there, the changes in microRNA expression, even some data from NASA. We had some data access to some data sets from NASA. And so we had both like a training set where we developed models and then we made blind predictions on the test set. And our inference protocol um, across these 18 predictions across the five performer teams, as this table shows, scored best on 11 out of 18 of those predictions. So the table there shows the teams uh, on the left in that leftmost column, and then the columns are the how each of the data are the data sets. And um, inference did really well across this kind of large and diverse data set and across these different contexts. And so um, that's why one reason we felt that we could build on the success of DARPA-Taylor and apply it to, you know, this MBA program 
uh, that we're doing today. So now here's a, a screenshot, kind of a high level just visualization of how um, each of the reasoners works as well as the meta reasoner. And so I'll go into some detail, but not like very specific details, you know, in terms of the specific probability models or that kind of thing that's being implemented here. Because um, I said, I, I primarily want to introduce the project and just give you a sense for what we're doing here. So the way case-based reasoning works is that it creates a, a case library, which we have this purple here. It, the case library is basically all the existing data, the training data, if you will, and the features and individuals for those. And it creates feature weights um, by linking the outcome or outcomes of interest to those features. And then what's, what's novel, what's unique about this case-based reasoning system is that it does this retrieval process where it says, okay, when I have a new individual where I wanna predict their performance or how they're gonna do, what we wanna do is find the individual who comes closest to in our database who matches that person. And by match, we mean, um, you know, like a, a distance measure. And we're just looking across that feature set and saying, okay, where, where's my where's my nearest neighbors, if you will, um, and trying to figure out like who's closest in that regard. And then once we have that, we can look at the performance of those individuals who are close or similar and say, okay, because this person is close to that person, there's other people, then they'll, they'll, we predict that they would do similarly well as those individuals. So that's the basic idea of case-based reasoning. And, And our second reasoner, like I said, is this Bayesian belief networks. Um, and as you can imagine, this will use these Bayesian belief next networks, but there's there's a, a four step process here. So in the first one, we just do something simple, fairly straightforward, this agglomerative clustering, which what this does, um, as, as you most of you probably know, um, Bayesian belief networks can be very computation expensive when you get a lot of variables in the data set. And like I mentioned, this data set has hundreds, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of variables. And obviously we can't put all of those into, you know, these Bayesian belief networks are just optimized that way. So we're trying to, to funnel down the variables of interest that might matter in a causal model. And so these first couple of steps get at that process of winnowing down the number of variables that um, we could include in the model. Um, by contrast, case-based reasoning, the other model we showed, doesn't depend on that step. It can take a huge number of variables out of the box and work with them. So um, just to give you a sense that these reasoners don't have to be like compatible or, or similar in that way. They, they can really do different things, um, and, but they, yeah, they can work together as I'll show you in the next slide. Um, so, so this Bayesian belief networks is trying to winnow down the set of variables that matter. And we use this agglomerative clustering as a first pass to try to find the individuals who are closest based on certain variables. And then we do in the second step, what we call um, phenotypic identification using something called Gaussian mixture modeling. Um, I, I'm less familiar with this particular step. I know um, our other colleagues in our team have developed details of this one. Uh, so I can't speak to the specifics as much, but uh, that's the second part. And then the third step is, you know, we have this reduced data set. Then we feed them into these more, um, these Bayesian belief networks. And so what we do here is in some cases, we'll find that there's different phenotypes, meaning different individuals um, are modeled differently. So in this toy example we have here, we see these three different figures. This would indicate like say across the sample of like hundred people, maybe you know a third of them are fit into this group, a third of this group, this group. So we're fitting basically unique models for individuals who seem to have different characteristics or features, and then using those unique features for those individuals to predict the outcome uh, in, in a kind of more personalized way. And then finally, there's this likelihood of waiting step, which we use to uh, identify the confidence we have in our outcome or result. Okay, so those are kind of just a little bit of insight into how the reasoners work. And then the we put what, what happens is we use this ensemble meta reasoning piece. And there's two requirements to make this work. You need a reasoner's predictions, and we were just for purposes of um, this project, you know, they're binary predictions. It doesn't like in the previous program, the DARPA Taylor program, it could be continuous variables or binary. Um, well, sorry, and I guess we, we adapted it to take binary data uh, for this program, but um, that's a strength, another strength of this inference framework. And so we have each reasoner, so we need the prediction, the binary prediction in this case, as well as um, what we call a confidence interval, confidence metric. And that's something we've been refining. We're moving towards having that be a probability, um, meaning a uh, measure of probability strictly defined, where you know if it's a zero, we're, we're not very confident that that prediction is good. And if it's a one, we say, yeah, we're very confident it's a good prediction. Um, but in our earlier incarnations of this, that confidence metric wasn't strictly tied to probability, but we're, we're moving that way. And we're trying to make that um, ratchet that down to be more a probability of a, a probability measure. And so those are the two pieces of information this meta reasoner needs is the, the prediction and the confidence. And then from that, we get this overall 
prediction, which it says, okay, we're gonna wait um, the predictions from each of the reasoners and then put that together and then get an overall prediction. And what's interesting about this meta reasoner is that sometimes we see that, um, you know, the overall meta reasoner can outperform either individual reasoner. Sometimes you'll get equivalent performance. Sometimes it'll be a little bit worse. And I think that's nice because that allows us to have more sensitivity in terms of how good our, our reasoners are doing. You know, if we have researchers making predictions, but they're like saying, hey, we're not very confident what we're doing, don't give those much weight, then the meta reasoner respects that and says, okay, let's, you know, maybe then overall, we just don't know what we're doing. But if the, both reasoners or one reasoner is really confident what it's doing, then the meta reasoner say, great, let's, let's really weight that heavily and give these stronger predictions. And so um, this is how it works. And what's nice about this framework is it, I think it's a, it's extensibility. So that means, you know, we have two reasoners, but like I said, we're also thinking about ways to roll in additional reasoners to hopefully enhance the robustness of the system. And just, um, I think I only have another slide or two here. Um, you know, we started, we developed this framework under Taylor, and so we had to do certain modifications to make it work for this um, MBA program. So like I've talked about, we have these individual reasoners, we've modified them in certain ways. The meta reasoner has been, you know, developing to make it more, uh, I think, robust and, and based on probability. Um, here, again, we had to predict outcomes, binary outcomes versus, you know, continuous variables like in the previous program. Um, we're pl we've played with a little bit of biological data in the, data in the previous program, but we're definitely, um, there's a huge swath of molecular and biological data that uh, we want to add in the, in the near term. So that's something that we think this framework can handle, uh, but we definitely are interested in doing more of that. Um, and like I said, there's a lot of flexibility built in inference in terms of the type of data streams they can handle. Um, you know, the, whether they have missing data or not, it's pretty flexible. The data can be raw or unprocessed. Sometimes, you know, we have statistical methods, this PN issue is an issue, but this, we don't have that problem here. So um, overall, it's a pretty robust system that's worked well for both you know, those programs we've, we've seen in performance so far. Um, so that's all I have right now. Um, like I mentioned in the beginning, we're, we're definitely interested in identifying potential or future collaborators who might be interested in working with us on this project. Um, if you are interested at all, please uh, reach out to me. There's my email address. Um, I, I coordinate a lot of things for, for our group and our, and our team. Um, you know, and I, if you reach out to us and express interest, most likely you talk to me first, but um, you know, we, we, we talk to the rest of our team. But we're, um, you know, the project goes on for another year, year, about a year and a half yet. So it's still got some time on it. And so we're definitely interested in identifying um, individuals who might be interested in this kind of work. Um, I, I can field some questions. Um, you said this, this project has what's called uh, classified, or sorry, controlled unclassified information. So I am restricted in what I can say, but um, if you have questions for me, like right now or, or in the future, I, I will answer them the best I can. But I also have to say, like, I can't go into those details with, without um, having full access to the, to the project because of its nature. So, so thank you. That's all I have. I'll stop sharing my screen or I'll stop talking at this point, at least, and see if there are any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chris. Thanks for the presentation. And uh, I will have this recording also available to all the PhD students at the department, though, to see those who are interested and to reach out to your to your team. Thank you for that, and thanks for the other people that who joined us. Yeah, thank you, Mary Dad, for the opportunity to come speak with you today. I appreciate it. Sure. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Have a good weekend. You too.